Good morning. How are we doing today? Good morning. Pretty good, thanks. How are you? I'm hanging in there. So, how are we feeling about things in the course today? Um, I'm quite behind after all of the um, <laughs> exams and everything, but still trying to catch up, to be honest. So I'm literally... Okay. <laughs> So, so where are you? I'm pre-occupier's liability. I think once we had exams and everything, my brain shut down. So even though we were, I was attending course classes, I still wasn't processing the, you know, the information, but it's okay. I'll just watch the, um, the videos and make my notes and catch back up. Okay. Well, that's, that's a lot of catching up to do. I know. <laughs> I know, but it's okay. It's okay. So, uh, okay. If you if you feel like you're confident in how your revision will go, uh, that's that's fine. I think I just have so, to create a, a plan for myself. How do you? Uh, sorry. Good, sorry. No. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was just saying. I think I had interrupted you, by I said I just I just need to create a plan for myself. But I think it was just hard for me to kind of, you know, take in the, the information that was coming in while trying to prepare for the other things, especially since we had a paper and stuff. But it, you know, yeah. I can't, that's not really an excuse as we still, it's still a course in itself. So it deserves its own amount of work, you know? So it's, it's okay. Well, tell, tell me about, I mean, what are your plans with this degree? Are you going to go on to law school and go into practice or... Are you going to do something else? Like what, what's the plan here? Honestly, I have not. And, there, and I, I, I'm not asking that. There's a, there's a reason for the, for me to ask this. So I'm right. I'm no, 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 it's totally fine. No, it's totally fine. It's totally fine. No, for me, I think so far I've been looking into like advocacy, but um, I said, you know what? Let me just take it mm -hmm. step by step. I definitely don't think for the most part, especially since I do get anxious, <laughs> um, that I'm not quite sure about the typical route for the law degree, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. So when you say advocacy, like going you're to referring to like lobbying. Of, you know, I'm not quite, not you know, like that, that's not necessarily me. But I mean, I don't know, right? I don't right. know. Um, so just taking it in stretch, taking each course, seeing kind of what I like. Um, I have, so advocacy was one of the things I've been interested in, you know, like, um, for example, well, actually, no, that's still a whole big bunch of stuff in the head. So yeah, I won't say that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, I know you're like, I'm worried. <laughs> well, what concerns me is that like, this is a profession that sort of chews people up. Exactly. And understood. one of the things that's important to learn very, yeah, one, one of the things that's important to learn very early in, in your career, if you're going into law, is how to balance multiple competing demands. Right, right? exactly. And I'm confident that you can Mm -hmm. but I'm concerned that it sounds like you're having trouble actually doing. Right, right. So I'm, I'm not, I, I have every confidence that you can figure this out, mm -hmm. but I want to encourage you to sort of like figure it out. So no, I you totally know, you're about it. to enter into it an exam, an exam period and mm -hmm you're not going to be a, in a position where you can sort of like focus on one thing and lay everything else aside. You are going to have to do some juggling. Right, I have to multitask, and that, it's and, so true. And, and so I'm, I'm concerned when you say that when you were you know, focused on midterms that basically nothing else existed for you. Right, right. As in, yeah, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, so, when you break it down, that does, that is it, you know what I mean? Like, I did kind of take stuff in, but it wasn't 
as you said, you know, it wasn't 100% like taking it all in. And that's true. I mean, for me, I also work full time. And so I think I'm just trying to, you know, but as you said, I do need to figure that, out my plan. That imposes its own challenges. I, exactly. I have to be, per- I don't, I don't know if you're enrolled full time or if you're in a, a part time program. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly if you intend to continue working full time, uh, I would encourage you to talk to the deputy dean about um, part-time. considering a, a part-time enrollment. Um, right. I just, I can't imagine taking a full load of courses and also working full-time and mm-hmm. also just like managing the, the process of keeping body and soul together. Right. Um, like that's essentially three jobs. Right. And look, I can barely do one. Yeah. I, I find the second shift, right? The, the process of keeping, keeping life together. Like I find, I find that extremely difficult mm-hmm. while also, you know, working full time. So it's, it's, exactly. a, it's a difficult process. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's move on. So yeah. And so what you said, that's actually quite true. So I figured I have to create another plan for, for second semester, just because I know it's not feasible for, for moving forward, because it does get harder, you know, and it gets more intense. So I, I have been trying to figure out what that plan is, but you know, versus work and stuff, because I would prefer to stay full time. Um, but um, so yeah, so I definitely have to kind of create that plan as well. <laughs> okay. Good morning, Kesrin. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. Morning. Morning. How are, how are we doing today? I w- well, I don't want to say great. I would say good. <laughs> Okay, why why only good? Why not great? <laughs> I don't want to like give an overestimation of my day and then after my week is not that well. So I just want to say good and then keep my hopes up. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So things are things are progressing well for you. You're moving toward the the end of the semester. Yes, sir. Okay. So how are we feeling about this week's activity? It got posted late, so it if if you have not had a chance to think about it, that's okay. But what do we what do we think about it? Is this the question with Albert? Yes. So what do we think about Albert's situation? So for this question, I would have um I would have read on nuisance. And for this question, I would have looked at private nuisance. But for me, it was like a bit. Mm-hmm. 
usually it's a situation where you can say, okay, this is what you do here and here. This is what we're going to look at. And then this is how we're going to fix your problem. In this situation, it felt more along the lines of one of those cases where you would essentially have to tell your client that, okay, legally here, there's nothing really much I can do for you. Yep. Why do you, why do you say that? Because when I was looking on um, I saw that the, the requirement that it had. And so, yeah, so I was looking at it and then I was seeing that it said that that there needs to be um, some sort of damage and the damage must not be merely minimal. And in this situation, I didn't see any damage. And then also with regards to the um, value of the property, I didn't see something that was affecting the value of the property necessarily, at least as far as I can see. So then from that first requirement was not, I was like, okay, we have a problem here. I still looked at the um, requirements though, but not the neighbor's actions were unreasonable and I couldn't say per se that it was. And so my advice to Albert was essentially like go and have a conversation with your neighbor and find out if they could make the fence shorter, if that's a possibility. And then that would that was essentially my advice. So there's a couple of, of moving parts here. The first one is I think you've correctly identified that there's not any damage to Albert's property, right? So there's not an encroachment on these facts. Um, there's not injury to the property. So you're correct that those categories don't apply. Um, but I'm not convinced that there's an issue, that, that there's not an interference issue. Because number one, right, let's think about um, what constitutes sensible damage, right? And you, you discussed a couple of these things, and I'm just sort of putting them into the category that, that they go into, right? So sensible damage is the non-minimal damage that reduces the value of the property. But there's absolutely a difference in property value for a piece of property that has an ocean view versus that which does not, right? And, and so that, that piece of the puzzle may be better, maybe better, you may have a better argument for Albert than you think you do. And the other piece of the puzzle is, is a, a substantiality argument. And let me grab my lecture notes because I just want to make sure that I don't make a mistake here. Come on, load up, please. And so the question is, does a substantial uh, interference, is there, is there a substantial interference here in that does normal, ordinary human living call for an ocean view? And the answer is maybe not, right? But there are there are some cases that you can draw on, and I, I'm not, I'm blanking on the, the name, so please don't ask me for them, but I know I've read them, where it appears that even though the phrasing, if you look at the lecture notes, right, the phrasing is sensible and substantial, there are definitely cases where it seems like the courts treat it as sensible or substantial. And so the, 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 the reduction in property value can be enough standing alone, right? Depending on the authorities you're drawing on, depending on the, the cases, right? These are, these are things that can be used. 
Okay. So does that make sense? Right, sort of what the idea behind um, Albert's argument here is? Yes, sir, definitely. Go ahead, Kesrin. So, so this fact pattern is a, a really pared down version of, there's a whole series of cases sort of across common law jurisdictions all over the world of what's called spite fence cases, right? Where the neighbor builds a fence that is much larger than necessary to, uh, you know, to accomplish any sort of reasonable privacy concerns, um, and they do it because they want to block the view of their neighbor, right, or block their neighbor's access to light, right, or something like that. Um, the courts are sort of divided on how they treat these fences, okay? You can find jurisdictions where the courts say, look, if your neighbor wants to build a 30 foot high fence, that's their business and you don't have a right to uh, anything that, they're, that, that that fence would take away from you. As long as it's on their property and as long as it's not damaging anything of yours, you know, get over it. Um, but then you can find cases where the courts say, well, look, you know, as, as we discussed just now, right, there is a property value to some characteristics related to the view, right? Sometimes the view is worth money and taking that away could lead to a development, right? Could lead to a nuisance claim. Um, how do you think you would prove uh, this reduction in property value in Albert's case? Like, let's say that, that you decide to make this argument to Albert, what evidence would you want to put on to demonstrate the reduction in property value to show a substantial interference or a sensible interference? Sorry. Well, I think, in practice, it would be a situation where you would have to get a surveyor to essentially value the land, one with the arm, the view, and one without the view. So, I mean, would you want, would a surveyor be the right expert? I, I'm honestly, I, I, I ask that because, um, my instinct would also be to hire an expert, but not necessarily a surveyor, because my understanding of what surveyors do is somewhat different. So I would not, I would not hire a surveyor to assess the value of land. I would hire a surveyor to, if there was a dispute over the boundaries. Um, but if you, if you tell me that in the Caribbean, surveyors, assess land values, then I, I will believe you on that. I'm not exactly sure, but that was my understanding. Yeah. I believe you, right? So, um, you know, What if you purchased the home for that purpose, peace and tranquility versus a concrete jungle, then it does interfere with the third category of a private nuisance. Why would you pay for that if that was not what you were looking for? Um, I, I think that's, I mean, I think that's true, right? I think that's part of the puzzle is um, what, what is what you, you know, what are the things that you've paid for? And what are the things that are attached to the value of the property? Now, what I will say is you do not have a right, right, as a property owner to say, well, I bought this property in St. Philip Parish and it's, you know, this is countryside and I'm not okay with a developer coming in and building houses all around me. Like you do 
not you don't have that that power. Right, understood. What you do have is the power to say the value of this property lies in the bucolic setting. And that value was reduced by all of these houses being built. Okay. So uh, go ahead, Alon. You you were off mute for a second there. And I No, I no, no. I was agreeing with I was agreeing with you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So 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 you have to frame it through the reduction in property values. And one of the things that I think is is important to, to remember is that the uh, the um, the remedies for nuisance don't include an injunction, right? So you won't you would not be able to get an order telling your neighbor to take down the spike fence or stopping the construction of the houses. Okay, what you would get is damages. So that's that's the that's an important piece of the puzzle. Okay, so what other questions do you guys have? What other concerns do you have? Not just about nuisance, but but anything else that's going on. Nothing? Last chance, going once, going twice. Okay, we will wrap it up then here, guys. This was really well done. I appreciate it. So, oh, sorry, there was one. Sorry. Someone sorry. just uh, asked I was just for, trying to, for a, sorry, I was trying to yeah. get my question. Sorry about that. Can you go through just a bit more of the duty of care to trespassers? I know you've probably gone through it already, but can you just go as per your question from last uh, last uh, last tutorial? So just a bit more sure. about the so duty of care to trespassers. The, sure. Sure. So trespassers are owed no duty except the duty of common humanity. Right. And there's a whole series of questions that courts ask to determine if that duty has been discharged. Most of those questions come down to like risk management actions. So things that you do before the trespasser comes onto the property to demonstrate to a potential trespasser that this is a place where you are not welcome. You are not, you are not supposed to go here, okay? And that is, and then if the trespasser comes on the property anyway, then the duty of common humanity just means that if you know they're on the property, if you know that they're on the property, you you have to take care of them if you know that they're injured. So that's that's it. That's the duty of common humanity. Uh, okay, cool, brilliant. Thank you. Okay. So 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 there can be a greater duty, right? There can be if if you failed to take the requisite risk management actions, right? There there can be you can be held liable for harm to trespassers if the property isn't posted, if there are you know, other issues, but beyond. But if, if you've done all of the requisite steps, then you're fine. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. 
Thank you. Anything, anything else? Anything else? Kezrin, I see you, you went and looked it up and I appreciate you letting us know, so. Last chance. Okay. Then we'll wrap it up here and I will see you guys tomorrow. So take care, guys. And Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good day, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you.